Hey everybody, welcome to another Dining Room Chalkboard lecture for our class, Liberalism and its Critics. It is day 63 on the count up. That makes nine weeks, exactly, and no end in sight. So uh, for today's lecture and for the next lecture, we're going to be looking at uh, the probably the most prominent and well-known and I would say direct critique of liberalism, uh, and that comes from uh, Karl Marx and his follower uh, and kind of, um, you know, most successful uh, uh, effect of Marxism is Lenin. Uh, so we're going to look at the Marxist-Leninist critique of liberalism. Today I'm going to focus on the critique of political liberalism, and for the next lecture it's going to be the critique of economic liberalism. Obviously they're, they're related, um, and uh, the Marxism is kind of a, is a, really, it does of all the things we've looked at so far, it really does fit the definition of a political ideology the most closely. And so it's an integrated, intentional perspective on the world, and it starts as a critique of liberalism, and it moves on towards a, uh, a prescription for what uh, can, will, and should follow, uh, historically follow liberalism and be the final uh, stage of human political and economic development. Um, the reason I break it out into two uh, classes is because there really are, even though Marxism is, is an integrated whole and it really, all of the um, premises are worked out and all of the areas and all of the uh, ideas are interrelated, it makes sense to look at the Marxist-Leninist critique of the uh, liberal democratic state, which is, uh, and the system of individual rights that are built around that, which is political liberalism, and the Marxist-Leninist critique of uh, the capitalist free market uh, uh, economic system, uh, which are of course related in uh, liberalism, and the Marxist and Leninist critique is, is definitely related, but they really are two separate things. The liberal democratic state doesn't have to be committed to a capitalist free market society. Historically it is, and there are important you know, philosophical connections between them, as we'll talk about today, um, but uh, they, they are, we can see them as kind of logically separate, and I think that the Marxist Leninist critique of each has a different uh, sort of uh, approach, I shouldn't say different approach, it has a different thesis. The thesis behind <clears throat> the critique of political liberalism is that the liberal democratic state and the system of individual rights that it supports uh, and emanates from is a sham. And the, that, that, that's pretty much it. The liberal, liberal democracy is a sham, and why? Uh, and in fact, it's more than a sham, it's actually a sort of, um, a, uh, it's an intentional lie that's told to people to keep them in a subservient position. Uh, the, uh, and of course, it supports part of, a big part of that system of individual rights that uh, it, it both upholds and emanates from is a set of uh, strong property rights, freedom of exchange, and the accumulation of wealth, the, really the two key components of what the property rights aspect of liberalism are. Um, obviously, that's t completely related to capitalism, but the critique of economic liberalism is that Cap the capitalist uh, free market system is an irrational, self-destructive system that sows the seeds of its own destruction and uh, brings about the conditions that are necessary for inaugurating a new and different and better and final economic system, uh, namely socialism. So there's basically, they work together because part of the critique of the political system is that it's upholding, it's a sham, it's upholding this economic system, and the economic system itself is irrational and self-destructive. So sweeping aside the uh, liberal democratic state and this system of individual rights that uh, it supports um, is a necessary step for moving beyond capitalism, but the critiques are different. They come from different uh, uh, angles, even though they're all sort of held together from the same set of Marxist-Leninist principles and assumptions. So, uh, today I'm going to talk specifically about why it is that the liberal democratic state is seen as a sham from the point of view of the Marxist-Leninist uh, ideology. Now, the important thing about uh, this critique is that it starts with a philosophy of history. Marx himself begins his career as a philosopher, uh, writer, activist, economist, there are many things that Marx is. This is actually one of the, one of the uh, things that's impressive about him and that has been so uh, much an important part of his influence over uh, at political and economic history is that Marx did a lot of stuff. 
And I should say, kind of give a disclaimer at the beginning here, even though we're spending a whole week and two uh, class periods, two video lectures on Marxism-Leninism, this is far from, as you probably can just figure out, far from a comprehensive uh, uh, take on what uh, Marxism-Leninism is. It's particularly heavily on the Marx and a little lighter on the Lenin, um, and I'm not really going to look at the, uh, a lot of the revolutionary action stuff that was a super important part of, of Lenin and what made the Russian Revolution successful and why Lenin himself was such an influential uh, figure. But um, Marx was a philosopher and a, uh, a political philosopher, a historian, an economist. He was actually one of the first economic analysts. Uh, he brings the idea of a scientific approach to economics. Um, he's one of the earliest proponents of doing that. He's also a very uh, uh, revolutionary economist because he's the first major one who actually launches a direct critique of the dominant economic system of the time, which is free market capitalism. He also was deeply involved in political movements. He was an activist. Uh, he, he wrote, in addition to writing really thick economic analyses like the three volume Das Kapital, uh, he wrote pamphlets and he wrote uh, um, smaller books. He wrote uh, all kinds of stuff that was intended to help move history along. So, he, he actually, unlike many uh, historical figures who've been influential, philosophical figures, he moved all over the range of uh, um, activity, from the most philosophical, which is what we're going to start with today, um, to uh, the uh, sort of the, the most practical, like writing pamphlets, communicating with communist parties, uh, looking at uh, real political movements, trying to help them move along. Uh, and so he's, he's both a philosopher, I shouldn't say both, he's a philosopher, he's a historian, uh, he is an economic analyst, he's a critic of the economic system, he's a political activist, he's uh, essentially a, uh, a wizened, at a certain point in his life, uh, a wizened advisor as well as uh, insightful analyst and critic. All that stuff. Definitely not going to do all of the things that Marx is. Uh, where we start with the critique of political liberalism is we start with Marx's uh, historical philosophy, which is uh, historical materialism. And to the extent that Marxism is actually a, a kind of a prolonged critique of liberalism, as well as then um, a, a, a developing alternative to liberalism, uh, and that, that is exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's a critique and then an alternative, it's a, there's a big story that is told. The first chapter of the story, the first move, is the, uh, the proposition of and the development of historical materialism. What Marx is doing, essentially, is he's saying that, okay, if we're going to talk about politics, and we're going to talk about, this, about society, and we're going to talk about the economy, and we're going to talk about human beings and human nature, what we need to do is we need to, for like, you know, want of a better way of putting it, we need to get real. Like, we need to do it in a real way. Uh, and uh, the idea of this hypothetical state of nature or some kind of abstract uh, um, uh, moral theory like utilitarianism or deontology, these are all just ideas. These are all just things that we talk about and cook up. They don't bear any real relation to the way human beings live. If we're going to look at politics, society, the economy, that's how people live. We're talking about organizing the way that people live their real lives. So we need to start from the real premises, not from some hypothetical BS, not from some kind of, well, this is what human nature is like, uh, or we're picking out certain traits of human nature to, to advocate for, and this is some kind of hypothetical, rational approach to putting all this together. That's all just a story. And in fact, one of the uh, features, and I'll, I'll get to in a second, but I'm going to gesture towards it now, of historical materialism is that our philosophy is not something that stands on its own as a pure form of thought and analysis. Our philosophy is always going to be an emanation of the way things are really going on. So philosophical ideas, the dominant philosophical ideas of a time, are in fact not driving the way the world is organized. They're a reflection of the way the world is organized. Historical materialism is where Marx says, we're going to look at the way things really happen. How do things really happen? Well, if you look at humanity, if you look at what we're, what we're, instead of saying, well, what are we like? What's human nature? What's the human condition in the abstract? If we look at what human beings are doing and have done, what is foundational for Marx is the way that we materially interact with the world. 
Um, the foundation of what human life is, is the actions that human take, humans take as they interact with the material world. So historical materialism is based on the reality of human interactions with the material world. And part of, I'll give you part of the intellectual backdrop here. I have to, something is on the floor here, getting in my way. I don't want to trip or be annoyed by that. Um, <clears throat> and unplug my laptop, I guess that's what that was. Uh, uh, part of the intellectual backdrop of where Marx is entering the, essentially the dialogue of Western philosophy is that the, at the time, the dominant notion in German philosophy and in European philosophy was uh, um, this Hegelian idea from uh, uh, Hegel, that, who was another German philosopher who preceded Marx by about a generation, uh, that the world was this kind of developing, uh, unfolding of some kind of universal spirit, which was uh, the set of ideas that, I, I, it's hard, honestly, it's hard for me to kind of make sense of Hegel until I go back and read it, and then I'm like, oh, it makes sense a little bit, even though it's kind of up in the air. The idea, though, is idealism. Marx is posing, uh, positioning himself against idealism, which says that hu human civilization, human society, human history is, work, is, a, is a set of working out a set of ideas, and that those ideas manifest themselves in the world. Marx is flipping that on its head and saying, no, the ideas don't drive the way we live. The way we live, the way we materially interact with the world, is what drives uh, our ideas and what drives our progress forward. So Marx is, he's, he's actually moving against the dominant idea uh, of uh, sort of Western philosophy at the time, which is that our ideas are the things that are driving how we live. Um, and if you think about liberalism, while Hegel was not uh, liberal, if you think about liberalism, it's, that's actually doing that. It's saying, our ideas about ourselves, about human nature, about the human condition, about rationality, those are the things that should tell us how we organize the world around us. Um, and uh, we are going to think through these philosophical questions to decide on a blueprint that will then determine how we build the world around us and how we transform ourselves. So Marx is saying that's, that is not how it happens. How it happens is that human beings are essentially, we're the laboring animals. We are the animals that evolved, and, and evolution, Darwin and Marx are contemporaneous, and so evolution as a doctrine isn't really there, but the ideas of evolution are actually, uh, Marx sort of applies them to human history in the way that, that uh, Darwin and Darwin's followers apply it to uh, biological history. Um, the human beings developed in this environment, and one of the things that makes us different, evolution created us as the laboring animal. What we do that other animals don't. Now, some biologists have discovered uh, that some animals do this to a certain extent, but in Marx's time this wasn't known, and it really is, there are only a few cases. What human beings do that other beings don't do is they reshape the material world around them to suit their needs and their wants. This is what makes us different. Instead of just responding to, reacting to, and adapting to the environment around us, uh, we reshape it. How? We reshape it through labor, through materially transforming the world. Now, uh, Locke has some kind of uh, connection with this idea because, remember, his idea of how we get property is we mix our labor with the world and therefore it becomes ours. Um, to Marx, he's like, okay, forget about what becomes ours. He does agree with and acknowledge uh, Locke's point about uh, labor that human beings mix their labor with the world. Uh, he sees what results from that in a very different way, but that's the starting point. Historical materialism, the reality of human interactions with the material world, what we do is we labor, and in our labor, we reshape the environment, and the reshaping of the environment reshapes how we labor, um, and what we do is we have built up economic systems that are based on the way that we are materially interacting with the world. So labor results in economic systems. And the nature of the economic system impacts how we, how, uh, we work. Um, and uh, what happens within the economic system is that we, every economic system has conflict within it. And Marx calls this class conflict. Because an economic system is always 
a system of class relations. That's what it is. And any system of class relations is going to have some kind of conflict built into it. There could be 10 economic classes, there could be five, there could be two, uh, but whatever, however the economic system divides up people into economic classes, that's gonna cause conflict. And this conflict is the driving force of human history. That's what is essentially the simplest way to put what historical materialism is. We start by looking at the reality of human interaction with the material world, and what we see is that the reality is that human beings are laboring, as we labor and transform the environment, we create systems. Those systems themselves generate class conflict. And the way that human beings behave within this system of class conflict impacts the movement forward of history. Uh, so there's a model of, uh, oh, and then what the class conflict results in, the class conflict results in the development of other types of systems, political, etc., systems, religious systems, uh, social systems, cultures, all of these things are an emanation of all of the ideas that we then have, right? This is essentially the material, and then what we get is we get the ideological. So we start with the material, and then we move to the ideological. So to kind of jump ahead a little bit, um, capitalism is the economic system that has developed out of the various uh, class conflicts that have, have moved human productivity and human labor forward and transformed human labor. Um, capitalism bring, generates a set of ideas about the world that get built into liberal democracy and, and other and cultural ideas and ideas about society. The liberal individual is an emanation of the capitalist uh, system because the capitalist system needs us to see ourselves as distinct units of exchange. And so the idea, the, the so social and personal idea that, that emanates from that is that we are distinct rights-holding individuals. Now, I've drawn this kind of as a downward development, but what I want to do over here, I save this spot on the board to put the kind of the, the completed model. And the completed model is this, that what we have is we have an economic foundation which is the mode of production, how we, how we actually labor, how we turn the world into the things that we need and want. And the mode of production uh, comes with it a uh, set of class conflicts. And the mode of production itself is going to have built-in contradictions. And the system of class conflict is kind of the material expression of those contradictions, the clash. And this what goes on here will drive history forward. This is history. Now, this is the foundation, and this is what's going on. And when Marx hits the scene, there really no, are no economists like we would think of economists. People who are actually looking at the mode of production and its principles and the way that things function. Uh, there, to the extent that there are any economists at all, now air quote economists, they are ideological economists. They are, they are philosophers of the economy. They're your Adam Smiths um, and your David Ricardos, the early, essentially, uh, philosophical architects of what capitalism is and what it does and how it runs. They are part of the ideological response to what's going on here. Marx is really the first person who says, hey, economics is actually a science. It's a thing that we can look at. The way humans are doing things, we can study it as a thing in itself. Part of the reason why uh, it is not studied is that in Marx's view, here it's underground, it's the foundation, and what's built over top of it is the ideological superstructure. So the foundation is laid down by the way humans really live their lives. Economics is foundational, the way that we produce and transform the material world into our needs, and then the way that those things are distributed and the class conflicts that result, the classes that, that arise and the class conflicts that result. What we do as human beings with our big brains is we build on top of that material reality, we build a set of ideas, right? The other little superstructure is a set of ideas as well as a set of institutions and the culture that supports those institutions, uh, that protects, it, it both reflects and protects this. 
uh, the economic foundation. Marx comes along and says, no one's looking at this. No one's looking underground. All we're looking at is the ideological superstructure. We're looking at the Enlightenment. We're looking at, uh, we're looking at um, the uh, philosophical discourse of liberalism. We're looking at the dominant culture. We're looking at what the family looks like. We're looking at how people are writing about uh, ideas. We're looking at the above ground stuff. Understandable, in a way, that we would look at the things that are right before us. We would look at the productions of our own big brain. But our brains, Primarily, the, what our brains do is they first have t teach us, we use our brains materially to figure out how to transform the world into the things that we need and want, how to produce and how to increase our production. And then we get ideas about that and we build that up. But we bury the economic foundation beneath the ideological superstructure. And what part of the set of ideas here is, uh, the, is political philosophy, religion, ideas about a personal identity, uh, cultural notions. Essentially, this is values and ideas. And this is what liberalism is. Liberalism is an ideological superstructure that grows up out of uh, capitalism. And for Marx, every stage in human history is a stage that uh, has a different mode of production Right? We've, uh, human beings have, in interacting with the material world, we've actually gotten better. There's, uh, the history here is progress, it's productive progress, and what we've also then developed is, um, this, is econ this is economic history, our then political, social, cultural history is culture and society moving forward as the way that human beings produce, transforms, and changes. So at any given point in history, you can look at the uh, way that people talk about uh, personal identity, the way they talk about uh, family and society, the way they talk about the political system, the way they talk about values, um, and uh, all of the metaphysics, the way that we know the universe and interact with it. All of that is just a bunch of stuff that we're laying on top of the way things really are. And at the point that Marx comes along, the economic foundation is capitalism, and the ideological superstructure is the liberal democratic state. And what the ideological superstructure does is it reflects, but also upholds and supports the particular uh, class conflict that's going on. It supports, within the class conflict, there's always going to be one or more dominant classes. And what this does, this whole set, because it results from the ideas of this class, it protects the dominant set of arrangements. And there's a very simple reason for that in Marx's view, and that uh, is that in every age, we produce all kinds of stuff materially. We also produce a bunch of ideas. The means of production are in the hands, are under the control of the dominant class. The dominant class controls the means of production. It claims for itself the right to do that with a set of ideas that support that. Um, but And one of the reasons why that works is that when you control the means of production, you also control the means of producing ideas uh, and thoughts. You control the dissemination of not, ju the, not just the distribution of, of uh, material uh, goods that are produced by the system, but the ideas that are as well. And so the, those ideas are never going to reflect the uh, exploited classes, the, the classes with less power in the economic system. They're always going to uh, they reflect and protect. Uh, as Marx says, I'm pretty sure it's in the, the passage in the German ideology that I gave you, uh, the dominant ideas of any age are the ideas of the dominant class. And that's, that's a pretty close paraphrase. It's probably not an exact quote. Um, if I were a little more prepared today, I would just pull out the reading and give you the quote. But th that's, the, that's the main idea. So why is it that Liberal, the liberal democratic state is a sham. That's the, essentially the critique uh, of uh, political liberalism. It is that this whole set of ideas that liberalism is built on, uh, that we are rights-holding individuals, 
sovereign individuals who are rationally uh, interested in uh, deciding our own way of life, conceiving of our own conception of good and acting on that, and that uh, we are separate individuals who want to live our lives this way, and that we set up society, we set up the political system to protect those rights, uh, is because that set of ideas, if generally uh, accepted, which we live in a world where it generally is accepted, uh, and Marx was living in a world where it was generally accepted as well. But that set of ideas, if generally accepted, is going to protect and reproduce the capitalist system. And in that system, the dominant class, the, uh, the, the uh, bourgeoisie, or the capitalist class, as he calls it sort of interchangeably, um, is going to continue to have the most power and gain the most benefit from this particular mode of production, the capitalist mode of production, um, if society generally accepts that set of ideas uh, and builds its political and, and uh, societal and cultural uh, systems and uh, institutions and ideas around that notion. It's a sham not because it's not compelling, it's a sham not because it doesn't tell some kind of truth. It does tell a kind of a truth. It tells the truth of the way the dominant class sees the world. That's what every ideological superstructure is going to be. It's going to be the truth as seen from the perspective of the dominant class. I'll put that up there. The truth, with air quotes, uh, as seen by the dominant class. And actually, one of the things that's so powerful about the ideological superstructure is that most of the members of the dominant class aren't necessarily even aware of the fact that uh, they're telling a, essentially a very convenient story to the rest of the world, that it's convenient because it, it supports and reproduces their power. They are just seeing the world the way they experience it. And when you're in the dominant class, it does seem as though we are separate individuals who are uh, rights holding and rationally want to protect our rights and uh, uh, maintain the uh, a high level of individual sovereignty as possible. Um, there are a lot of ways in which people derive, and Marx didn't talk a lot about privilege, but it's kind of the term that, that uh, we now have that expresses one of his core ideas, but um, your privilege essentially blinds you to what to your own viewpoint. It makes you think that the ideological superstructure that you accept is actually the truth of the universe. Because from your point of view, it is, right? And what we don't realize, human beings are, we're, we have very powerful, very big brains, but we're not really good at noticing that all of our claims are from a particular perspective. Marx focuses on the class perspective and says that we, you know, we can't help, the dominant class can't help, but see the world uh, as the way it is, the way it should be, that's natural because here I am, like, I'm, I'm at the top of the pyramid, of course I deserve to be here, and it's because this is the way everybody is, right? Um, anybody who's ever pulled themselves up by their bootstraps in the American term, who's, who's, ever, who's a self-made person who started poor and ended up doing very well, um, they look around at the rest of the world and they see people who didn't do that as weaker or losers or less, uh, less uh, um, productive, less efficient, less innovative, and less valuable to society. They, they can't help but see, look at that, the world that way because it's very, you know, part of our, and this is Marx, again, doesn't, doesn't delve into evolutionary psychology, but part of our evolutionary psychology is that we, um, our brains have developed to protect ourselves from inconvenient truths. Uh, and uh, one of those inconvenient truths is, oh, maybe it isn't the way I've lived my life isn't the way everybody else has lived their life. If I've pulled myself up my, by my bootstraps and other people haven't, it's because there's something right with me and something wrong with them. That's a very natural fallacy to fall into. And it is, in fact, uh, connected to or really supports uh, why the uh, um, ideological superstructure develops the way it does. The dominant class sees itself as the natural expression of the way things are. And uh, that must be the way the universe is organized. It must be the truth of the human condition. It must be the truth of human nature. The way I act is human nature. Uh, and if I'm on top, this is the best version of human nature that there possibly is. Because the dominant class controls not just the means of material production, but the means of, of uh, ideological and cultural production as well, then the culture and uh, the societal ideas and the political system are all going to reflect that perspective. Uh, to, from Marx's point of view, he doesn't even necessarily blame the capitalist class for saying, here's what's the truth, for developing this liberal uh, um, 
this liberal political philosophy, this whole liberal perspective, uh, it is essentially that's just what human beings do. We reflect in our ideas our own sort of feelings about uh, our own successes and why it is that we're the natural right thing. It's protective. It's self-protective. What Marx, why he would call it a sham is because it's not the truth in uh, the, with a capital T. It is a provisional perspective from the point of view of one economic class and it supports and, only, and benefits only that single class. But, and this is the thing that's, that from the Marxist point of view is so horrible about the ideological superstructure, it actually convinces everyone else that the, this is the natural order, right? Every ideological superstructure built on whatever mode of production, whether it's, whether it's uh, slavery or the feudal system of Europe or uh, the capitalist system, it, it, cre it brings with it the sense of naturalism. This is the natural order. The, 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 the philosophical apologists are always talking about the, it, that it's natural, right? Capitalism is just the natural way. Hu greed, self-interest, uh, innovation, these are the way that human beings are, and uh, the, uh, uh, an economic system built on that is the correct system. So it essentially inverts this and says that at the bottom uh, of the way human history is, is a set of traits and ideas, and then we organize ourselves to reflect those. Marx is saying it's, it's actually the other way around. It's not surprising that the truth, as seen by the dominant class, becomes the broader truth about society. But it's a sham in a double sense. One, it's not capital T truth. Um, it's a very provisional contingent truth based on a particular economic set of economic arrangements that is neither uh, natural nor is it permanent. It has come from somewhere and it's, and it's developing into something else. The, the class conflict, which drives the changes in, in uh, history, um, economic history, is, is, the, is transforming the economic system. And so our ideas change as well. Uh, it's not as though we're just getting closer and closer to the truth of the universe, the capital T truth. It's that we're getting new truths based on a new uh, set of economic arrangements. And at each stage, to the dominant class and to everyone else who buys the ideas of the dominant class, which is the vast majority of uh, any given society, it seems like the truth. But it really isn't. So the notion that liberalism is the expression of a natural... Uh, 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 formation of human nature, that we are separate individuals, that we are rights holding, that we want to and are capable of exercising our individual sovereignty. These notions are all true in the air quote, small t sense of the word, that they represent what it is that capitalism wants and needs from us, and that the capitalist class, which dominates this economic system, wants and needs everybody to behave by. We should see ourselves as separate, free exchanging, free choosing, rights holding beings. Because that set of people interacting in that particular way is what upholds the capitalist mode of production. So uh, the political system is a reflection of what it is that the economic system needs to sustain itself. Right? But, and here's the thing, class conflict is a conflict. The dominant class dominates, but they don't have, they don't do so without there being resistance and uneasiness and uh, dissatisfaction on the part of the other economic classes. And what that means is that there are cracks in the ideological superstructure. There are people who don't necessarily believe it. There are critics of it. There are, there, there's, there's a discomfort because it's presenting itself as capital T truth, but it's really just lowercase air quoted T truth uh, it, it is a very contingent truth that supports one particular way of life. And since that's the case, it feels unnatural to people who are in different, uh, who are in different economic classes. If you're in the laboring class, if you're in the proletariat, this notion that uh, we have freedom uh, when we have our individual rights protected and when, our, and when property rights are protected doesn't quite feel right. It's like, well, my right to free exchange and to accumulate wealth are supposed to be something that I inherently and innately want to protect. But free exchange is only hurting me. It's making me worse off. And there's the way things are, I'm not accumulating any wealth. So what good are these rights? Um, now, it, because this kind of dissatisfaction with the dominant, uh, with the ideological superstructure, with the dominant ideas, is sort of inevitable uh, because the 
dominant class is always going to be a small group, and a lot of people are going to be out there uh, feeling the chafing of the ideological superstructure. Uh, there, there's going to be a lot of power exerted by the dominant class to make sure that this set of ideas is uh, widely held and that the actual practices, the day-to-day -day practices that people engage in are oriented towards those. And so not only is it important for uh, people in a capitalist society to see themselves as uh, free exchanging, rights holding, separate individuals who are seeking to further their interests and accumulate wealth and, and, and become materially better off, it's also necessary to have cultural uh, and political systems that will reinforce and actually enforce those ideas. So the liberal democratic state is not just an emanation of the ideas that uh, are sort of at the heart of the capitalist uh, economic system. It is also essentially a police force to protect that set of ideas. So these institutions are there to make sure that people don't reject the dominant set of ideas and don't seek to uh, um, do things in a different way. Don't look at the capitalist system and say, oh, okay, so what we're doing here, you're saying, is we're free exchanging, we, we, we use our instrumental rationality to make exchanges, and we're seeking to make ourselves better off by moving towards our conception of the good, and we have the right to accumulate wealth, uh, but I'm not accumulating wealth, and I'm not getting better off. I'm, I'm actually, the more productive I am, the worse my life is getting, uh, how, how does that make any sense, right? Well, as soon as like, the, the, any, anyone or some group of people takes that step, the state is there to then use the power of the state to crush any kind of dissent from the dominant set of ideas. Um, and this is where the uh, liberal democratic state moves from being a sham to actually being an outright uh, fraud because if it's necessary to be hypocritical, uh, uh, to, to sort of uh, ignore for a time the dominant ideas and sets of values in order to protect the, the, uh, the, uh, the power structure, uh, then the liberal democratic state, any state will do that. Hypocrisy is not a problem. And the reason why it's not a problem is because the ideological superstructure is not a set of coherent ideas that developed on its own, and so hypocrisy would feel like, or inconsistency would feel like a deep flaw. It is an emanation of a, of a power structure of an economic power structure. And so when the economic power structure is threatened, the political power structure doesn't have any difficulty being inconsistent or being hypocritical to make sure that what's really protected is the underlying uh, dominant classes, uh, the underlying uh, arrangement that, that supports and benefits the dominant class. Um, so not only is the liberal democratic uh, state a, a kind of a lie, it's, it's, it's not what it promises to be. It's not the truth of human existence. It doesn't protect this thing which is key to all of us persons. It is upholding a economic power structure. It also isn't really about values. It's ultimately all about power. It reflects and protects. Right, the class, the dominant classes that control the means of production. This is a economic power structure. And the political power structure up here is not dedicated to making sure that the values and ideas that underlie it philosophically are manifested in the world. They'll do that if possible, and that's part of the story. As long as it can do that, people are like, oh, I guess it really liberalism really is this system that's trying to protect our individual sovereignty. Um, it's really ultimately a power structure that's intended to support the economic power structure. And it, and for Marx, again, that's not, like he he's actually he's not pissed at this. He just he, he he completely understands why that would be the case. If you're if if there's a if there's a power structure, and you're doing well under that. And let's, let's think about antebellum, uh, the antebellum South. If you're a, if you're a wealthy, white, plantation-owning, slave-owning person, of course you're going to want to create a political system that's going to support and reinforce and make sure that you stay in that position. And of course, because you're the minority and the dominant class is always the minority, sometimes a tiny minority, like the, you know, the, the white plantation class in, in antebellum South was... Uh, numerically one of the smallest dominant classes in human history, uh, 
the, 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 the smaller and more vulnerable you are, the more you have to exert your cultural and political power. Uh, you're going to support ideas that get everyone else to think, oh yeah, that's right. Slaves are, black people are an inferior. They're a childlike race. And the Bible does support slavery because it has this. And states' rights are important because uh, th that reflects uh, the founding documents. All of the ideas are going to be shaped and bent in a direction to, one, convince the mass of uh, the underclass, whatever the underclass might be. And in the case of the antebellum South, the underclass was both poor white farmers, uh, middling artisans, and of course, uh, African-American slaves. Um, there was a, you know, a, a, it wasn't just two classes, it was multiple classes. But all but the dominant class needed to imbibe a set of ideas. And if a substantial enough portion, or even just a decent minority of the, of the uh, underclass buys into the political structure, they can then be used as essentially as an army to enforce the uh, economic power structure to the official political power structure. And that is, uh, that's, Marx isn't surprised that's what's going on. If you're a wealthy white planter in the Antebellum South, of course you're going to act in this way. Um, it is, uh, it, it, Marx doesn't think that human beings are going to be able to look at this whole thing and transcend their, uh, transcend their position. There are, there are, and Marx himself is one, one of them, there are class traders. There are members of the dominant class who look at the world and go, oh, this is not the natural order. This is actually just a dominant class exerting its dominance through culture, uh, society, and politics, and religion. Um, there are going to be some people who do that, but that, that is not going to be the normal thing that human beings do. Um, now, one of the things that I think, the last thing I'm going to mention uh, in this is that the philosophical and cultural and political epistemological metaphysical ideas um, all are essentially related to a conception of human nature. Our philosophies, our political philosophies particularly, really are about taking our, uh, our ideas about human nature and building a political and social uh, and societal structure around it. For Marx, there is no such thing as human nature. There's no, there's no pure normative standpoint. There's no set of traits there's, that we have that we can discover and build into uh, our uh, political ideas. What our ideas about human nature are, like all of our ideas, it's a reflection of the particular economic system that we find ourselves in. So when we say that humans are acquisitive and liberty-loving and self-interested, uh, th that is not human nature. It's capitalist human nature. Um, when we say that uh, people are uh, fundamentally tied to land and there's a natural social order and there's an organic class structure, that's not human nature, that's feudal human nature. Um, but at each stage, there will be this notion of, that, that of human nature that is not adjectivized, right? It's just human nature. It's not capitalist human nature or feudal human nature or uh, um, uh, ancient slave-based human nature. It's seen as human nature, much like truth with a capital T, it's human nature with a capital H and a capital N. Um, and, but of course, it really just is, I shouldn't say of course, but from Marx's perspective, it is a lowercase lettered, adjectivized claim that is incorrect, but it's true in the sense that it does reflect not the truth of the human condition, but the needs of the economic foundation. So our ideas about ourselves, how we see ourselves as beings, is fundamentally a reflection of the way that the dominant economic arrangements need us to see ourselves. And then, of course, there are so many messages, as well as power structures, as well as physical punishments, that are going to keep people focused and aligned on that notion. And so when somebody says, well, capitalism is the natural uh, economic system because human beings are self-interested, uh, acquisitive, rational, uh, that they're right contextually. Within the capitalist system, human beings will be like that, but not because we're like that fundamentally in some kind of foundational way. It's because we have grown up in that world, we've been acculturated, uh, all of the messages from every direction, uh, as well as all of the institutions and then the physical punishments and physical incentives are pushing us to accept this one of a number of different potential versions of what human nature is. But we then, and this is a term that Marx uses, I'm not sure if it's in the readings from today, but uh, he talks about that we fetishize uh, 
these ideas. We take them to be natural. We take them to be the truth. Instead of seeing them as a provisional, air-quoted, lower, lower uh, case truth, we build it into a capital T truth. So what does it take to transform our political system? What does it take to move forward? What does it, what does it take for a class that is not the dominant class to get out from underneath this economic power structure that is uh, all supported by a political and a cultural power structure? It takes, to a certain extent, a critique of this underlying notion of human nature. And one of the key concepts for Marx um, is the notion of false consciousness. And what the false consciousness does is it gets a group of people who belong to a dominated class to accept that the ideas of the dominant class, which support that dominant class's uh, dominance, are natural and true. And it, it's a false consciousness because uh, it doesn't reflect the reality of your position in the class structure. It doesn't reflect the reality of what the particular mode of production is doing to you. Um, it's telling you a lie. That's why it's false. It's telling you a lie. It's saying that the, what supports these people over here who are benefiting from your action is true and natural. And so a big part of uh, the political uh, strategy and the political task of a Marxist-Leninist is to reveal the false consciousness, uh, attack it, and get people to reject the false consciousness. Now, uh, that's a kind of a philosophical and cultural task. There's also an economic side to it, and this is where the uh, Marxist-Leninist critique of uh, economic liberalism comes in. It's basically the false consciousness uh, of uh, the world that Marx and Lenin were living in, and probably the world that we're living in as well, is the idea that capitalism is the natural and best economic system for human beings. That notion is what Marx and Lenin and any Marxist-Leninist has to puncture. You can't change the world. You can't dismantle the ideological superstructure without attacking and uh, the false consciousness. And then, of course, you have to replace it with a new consciousness, which uh, Marx and Lenin both refer to as a revolutionary consciousness, a true class consciousness, an awareness of what your class is, what position it has in the mode of production, uh, and what will benefit you and your class, uh, and what kind of transformation of the economic system will happen. But first, you have to make people accept that what is taken by the world to be the truth or the true consciousness is in fact a false consciousness. For Marx and Lenin, uh, part of that task, not all of it, but a big part of that task is making the people for whom capitalism works against them, making them realize that capitalism is in fact not the natural and best system, and therefore the liberal democratic state, which is b built to uh, it's built out of ideas that reflect the needs of capitalism, and it's built to specifically protect it, even if it has to be hypocritical and consistent, that the liberal democratic state is not their friend. Capitalism is not serving you, and the handmaiden of capitalism, the liberal democratic state, is, uh, is uh, not serving you. It's a sham, and it needs to be rejected. It's part of that false consciousness. So this is a hardcore direct shot at the heart of what liberalism is. Liberalism is claiming that there's this view of the world centered around the sovereign individual that is true and right. And Marxism is saying, not only is it not true and right, it's actually supporting a power structure that, that is uh, um, exploitative and that actually harms the vast majority of people, those who are not in the dominant class. But how do you reveal that false consciousness? How do you transform that that false consciousness into a true class consciousness, into a revolutionary consciousness. For Marx, one of the things that you do is you do an economic analysis of the system to show what's going on below the surface to the people who are living above the surface. And that is what a, a big chunk of Marx's work is. Um, and uh, in the 19th century, workers who were part of the communist movement would read Marx's economic works. They would read, they would have workers' uh, study groups where they would read Das Kapital because what was important was uh, not just knowing this general historic materialist philosophy, which is important, but what's really important is knowing how does the capitalist system actually function in reality, like looking below the surface. 
So what Marx is doing in his economic works and our, and our uh, um, uh, discussion next time, or my lecture next time, we're not going to discuss anything because this is a camera, not people out there, sadly, for me and for all of us. But uh, what we're going to do, what I'm going to do is look below the surface and see why is it that capitalism is an irrational and self-destructive system. Liberal democratic uh, philosophy is a false consciousness. Capitalism is a true mode of production. It really is the way things are organized, and it really, is, uh, really does exist. Um, and it's an important stage, actually, for Marx, uh, because capitalism not only uh, is irrational and sows the seeds of its own destruction, it's also a necessary step forward in the class struggle. And it's a necessary step towards uh, transcending the class conflict that has marked all of human history and generating what Marx and Lenin hoped to be, and I think naively hoped to be, uh, a classless society. Um, but the, uh, the economic analysis is necessary because of the power of the ideological superstructure to fool most people into believing that this notion and the philosophy and the self-conceptions and the cultural ideas that uh, go along with it, that those are actually just a provisional, contingent, air-quoted, lowercase t truth that is only the truth from the perspective of one very small class that uh, does not reflect the truth of, of human nature or the reality of the world, but the current state of who is dominant and uh, the fact that they get to continue having the um, role, in the control over the means of, of ideological production as well as material production. All right, until uh, next time, that is the Marxist-Leninist critique of political liberalism. I'm your professor, Jack Miller. Thanks for your attention.